From KGW News, this is Straight Talk with Laurel Porter. Welcome to Straight Talk, I'm Laurel Porter. We've heard a lot about the fear of fake news, and now there's a new survey showing disinformation is taking a heavy toll on trust across the globe, and the United States is taking the biggest hit. A trust barometer conducted online surveys of 33,000 people in 28 countries to find out who they trust, who they don't trust, and how that's changed over time. It was done by Edelman, and Edelman is a worldwide communications and marketing company. Its report found trust in institutions in America saw the steepest, most dramatic decline in the 18-year history of the barometer. The authors call it a crisis that needs to be addressed by government, businesses, media, and non-government organizations or NGOs. Here to explain what has led to this crisis, what can be done to change course, and the possible consequences if we don't. Welcome to my guests from Edelman, Stephen Kehoe, who is the global chair of reputation for the company. Regina Lawrence is the executive director of the George S. Turnbull Portland Center and Agora Journalism Center with the University of Oregon. And Wei Li Chong, the president of KinderCare, the nation's largest private provider of child care and early education, serving more than 170,000 families. Welcome to Straight Talk. It's great to have you all here. Thank you. Let's go around the table and just a quick take on what you think the world is like we're living in when it comes to trust and how much that concerns you. We'll start with Regina. Um, trust is very much on the minds of practically everybody in the media industries these days. Um, trust in media has been in decline for a long time, but it's starting to decline very rapidly, and the Edelman barometer uh, shows that it's the media in particular that's the focus of distrust these days. And Whaley, from a business point of view. I think for both consumers and for employees, if, uh, if you don't trust an organization, you're not going to spend your money with them. We're learning that more and more. It's just an irrational uh, concept when you spend your money is becoming such a, a, a focus for businesses. And in, as an employee, if I don't believe in what the leadership is doing, uh, a lot of employees are making decisions to find uh, elsewhere to work. So it's, it's such an important factor. And Stephen. Yeah, well, we live in a world of distrust, um, and to the extent to which we see trust as a proxy for how confident people feel about their lives and stable, we need to be deeply worried about that based on what we've seen. But it also depends on where you live in the world. In Asia, you're generally quite happy and confident with the way things are going. In Europe, you're somewhere in the middle. And as you've already alluded to, it's here in the United States where we're seeing the biggest challenges that need to be addressed. And you're the author, one of the authors of the report. How significant is this barometer? Why do it? Well, we've been doing this barometer for about 18 years. Um, and it started back in 99 with the battle for Seattle where uh, we saw the protesters on the streets and asked ourselves these questions. These NGOs, these non-governmental organizations, who are they and are they having an impact? And what we found was, is having studied trust around this, that they had a very high level of trust amongst the general population. So this got us to think about not just trust with NGOs, but also media and business and government kind of overall. And we've been measuring that over 18 years. And what we've seen this year are some really sort of staggering results um, in terms of some of the trends that we've seen being overturned. Business is now almost as trusted as NGOs, and media, as Regina's pointed to, has descended to levels of distrust of government around the world. And those trends are really kind of quite new and the ones that we need to focus on. Let's break down the report. The Edelman report says the U.S. is enduring the worst collapse in the history of the trust barometer. It says the U.S. has reached a point of crisis. And we have a graphic from the report that shows the U.S. is below average when it comes to trust among the general population globally. You can see there China is at the top. Mexico and Canada are ahead of the U.S. Now, this is with the general population. If you look at the informed mm. public, which is defined in your report as college graduates with higher salaries consuming a lot of media, the U.S. is actually rock bottom, dropping 23 points since last year. Whaley, what's your reaction to that? Yeah, I, I think about it from a business standpoint that uh, trust is becoming so important in terms of how people just make sense of the decisions that you're making. And, and for kinder care, we were at a place where we were struggling in 2012 we were in a financial crisis and, and our new CEO, Tom White, came in. And interestingly enough, when you look at a company that's struggling, he quickly recognized that we need a transformation in our culture. And it did start with trust. And we started going through focusing on how do we actually rebuild trust 
first with our employees mm -hmm. and, and creating this, this culture of unity that we were actually making decisions in, in their best interest. And, and that became such a, a lightning rod for us to begin a company that started back on a path. And proud to say 2017 was the best year in our company history. And when we look back, it was truly building that trust back. So it is such, such an important factor. Well, trust is key. I want to read a, a quote from the report, and then I'll get your take on that. It says, it is no exaggeration to state that the U.S. has reached a point of crisis that should provoke every leader in government, business, or civil sector into urgent action. Inertia is not an option, and neither is silence. The public's confidence in the traditional structures of American leadership is now fully undermined and has been replaced with a strong sense of fear, uncertainty, and disillusionment. And I think, Stephen, when this report was done, you know, the economy was surging, stock markets right. up, unemployment's mm -hmm. down. It doesn't seem to fit. What's happening here? Well, I think it's, I mean, there's a number of things that have been going on in parallel uh, to all of that here in the U.S. You think about um, the, uh, the reports around fake news, uh, Russian alleged interference in the U.S. elections taking place, um, the Me Too movement, um, the um, reports around uh, the police treatment of black youths. These all sort of contributed towards a rise of anxiety throughout what we saw the, the whole of last year. And, you know, and the result of this is I think people have uh, genuinely taken a look at their lives and they've taken a look at all the news reports and they've become on the one hand disengaged from the media um, and on the other hand very suspicious of the kind of information that they're receiving. In short it's kind of uh, we've got a point got to a point where people no longer believe uh, know what to believe uh, they don't know who to believe and that has led to a sort of a lack of structure and places for them to cling on to to really go to to understand who is telling the truth and who isn't telling the truth and that's something that needs to be seriously address when we time to think about solutions. Well, let's explore this idea of fake news. The Edelman Trust Barometer found that media has become the least trusted global institution for the first time, and one of the biggest concerns is fake news. Seven in ten people in the respondents in the survey say the wor they worry about fake news and that false information could be used as a weapon, which we saw in mm -hmm. the presidential election. Fifty-nine percent say it's getting harder to tell if a piece of news was produced by a respected media organization. The research shows fully half of the respondents, and you mentioned Ms. Stephen, indicate they consume mainstream media less than once a week, so mm -hmm. they're becoming disengaged. Mm -hmm. Regina, does any of this surprise you? <laughs> well, um, it's distressing, that's for sure. It's not necessarily surprising because we've seen the indications in other survey research as well. Um, as I mentioned, uh, media trust has been in decline for some time, but of course it's accelerated since the last election, and in part a reaction to concerns about so-called fake news. Of course, we have to point out that there are more, there's more than one variety of fake news. That term has a couple of meanings, and so what people are reacting to perhaps in these surveys, for some people, uh, fake news is misinformation, disinformation, Russian meddling, etc. For other people, fake news really means the mainstream media, and of course our president has led that charge, accusing mainstream media of peddling fake news. So it's become quite complicated. Mm. And we're seeing that people are defining media, including social media platforms. And we have another graphic to show that 65% of respondents consume their news through platforms, people grouping here the platforms in with the media. But when you break it out, you can see that journalism actually gained some trust, five mm -hmm. points, and the platforms went down two points. Stephen, what's the significance of that? I, I think this is really significant. And it's, it's an important finding for this year's survey because for the first time, what it's indicating, you can see from the graphic here that broad Broadly, um, trust has moved up and down broadly in about the sort of the same level between journalism and online media and search. And here we're seeing this bifurcation. In fact, um, in the US side, that, that split is even greater. We've seen an, a, a minus 11 point drop in trust in, in platforms and social media search um, here in the United States. And so what this is telling us is that people are beginning to understand a difference between mainstream journalism and the news that they're receiving through platforms. Um, and still, 65% of people today get majority, get their news from platforms, so it's not that they're stopping to use even it. Even they don't trust it, they even still get their news trust that it. way. This is how they're consuming their news. And so, you know, I, I think that um, this is maybe the start of, um, I don't know, an education and awareness amongst people, the public at large, about the difference um, uh, between sources. Um, and, you know, we've seen some of that play out in the last few weeks. Um, 
now, this uh, survey was done, I think, before the Facebook scandal right. with uh, the C Cambridge Analytica. Do you think that would have made a difference in the survey in the United States? I I'm sure it would have led to a difference in the survey, though we should note we've already seen that drop. So there's already a distrust level starting to set in with platforms. And, you know, um, amongst, um, you know, amongst industries, amongst, amongst platforms, the, the social media has, is now the least trusted amongst all of the, uh, the media outlets that sort of look there. One of the interesting statistics we've also seen sort of this year is, is that trust in a person like myself um, in uh, giving me information is still relatively high. If, you know, if I get information from a family or friend, about 68% of people say, I fundamentally trust that. But when the same information comes across a platform, that reduces to 44%. So just the way in which information is being conveyed today um, seems to make a difference in whether or not that, that information is credible. One of the things that's getting a lot of attention this week, Sinclair Broadcasting, which is a conservative-leaning company and the largest owner of television stations in the country, is requiring all of its stations and local anchors to read what they call a journalistic responsibility message, word for word, written by Sinclair. The message addresses the importance of unbiased reporting and also complains about fake news. I want to play just a little mm. clip of it, and then we'll talk about that a bit. We are extremely proud of the quality, balanced journalism that CBS4 News produces. But we are concerned about trouble and trying to get responsible one side of the news stories playing our country. Now that's just a mock-up of all the anchors across the country, or some of them saying the same message. When it comes to try to rebuild trust, is something like that harmful or helpful? Are you have a take on that, Whaley? You know, I think it's one thing to declare your intent. I think it's an, another piece to uh, drive continuous behavior and progress that builds credibility. We, we believe just in authenticity. And uh, if you say you're going to do something, then do it. And over time, I think trust is an outcome of, uh, of people believing that when you say something, it actually happens. And, and we're aligned in our values, and I can support everything that you're saying. Mm. Uh, so I think it's a start. Regina, what do you think about that messaging? Um, one thing that's interesting, there's a recent study out about Sinclair in particular, and uh, one thing that the study found was that in communities uh, with Sinclair stations, uh, people who lean more liberal or democratic are dropping away from that audience. And that study, of course, was completed before this last um, story broke this past week. So it's just another indication that so much around the question of media and media trust has become really politicized. And the country's really breaking down along political lines. According to the survey, U.S. trust in the media diverges along voting lines. The report shows only 27% of people who voted for President Trump trust the media versus 61 percent of respondents who voted for Hillary Clinton. There's a 34 point difference. So really showing the, the country divided. I want to move to talk about China and China and the U.S. moving in opposite directions. Mm -hmm. The barometer shows mm -hmm. the two most powerful nations in the world diverging. Trust in government, media, NGOs, and business in China all up on the survey. All four are down in the United States, you see here. While trust in the U.S. is declining, trust in China is soaring. China, the number one market on the trust index. How do you explain that, Stephen? You, you've worked in emerging markets. You just got back from China where you presented this report to a Chinese audience. Tell us about that. I mean, the, um, the, we have seen a steady increase in national confidence um, in China over the last few few years amongst the people against all of the institutions uh, that we're looking at. Now, you know, it traditionally and typically trust, um, people say they trust institutions anyway quite highly in China. And we always take a look at that to sort of see whether or not what is driving behind it. And really we're looking at the trend over 18 years. There's just been this gradual increase in trust. Um, and no doubt there is a strong association between media in China and the government in China. If you trust the government, you're, you're inclined to sort of trust, trust the media. But there's a new mood, um, I think, what we're seeing in China. And we're seeing it amongst Chinese companies. We're seeing it amongst Chinese consumers and the way w the, which they think about their businesses going overseas and starting to do this. It, there is a sense that there is the beginning of them now being able to take their role on the national stage with a higher degree of confidence than they've ever felt before. People feel good in China about the way in which the government's taking them, and, uh, and that is reflected in these high degrees of confidences. Obviously, it's the complete opposite effect in the US, where the other uh, interesting point to note is it's the first year where we've seen trust in all institutions in a particular country go down at the same time which has, is, is what has happened in the US. So as you say, a polarization of trust um, that between these two 
economic superpowers. And there is a, a, that lack of trust is having a negative effect on the American brand, mm. Brand USA. Trust in companies based in the U.S. has dropped five points from 55 to 50 percent just in the last year, and that was already falling from 61 percent in 2014, so an 11 point drop over a few years. Whaley, as a businessman, how, does, how much does that concern you when you see the USA brand dropping like that? You know, I think on the global scale, it becomes really, really important for us to think about how do we uh, compete globally. I, th I think locally, though, uh, we just have to go back to the fundamentals of how do we rebuild trust, which goes to a lot of the conversation we were having around how we're managing information and, and how do we get to a place where we can talk about different points of view with the intent of making progress. And I think right now, uh, there's a significant divide of, of just sharing different points of view and almost ostracizing one another because you have a different point of view. So I think the root issue, at least from a business standpoint for me, is to make sure the consumers and employees are all gathering together to share information and, and making sure that we're listening much better and responding in a way that will uh, give consumers confidence, pride, and, and acceptance of, of companies and brands. But how are you doing that specifically, navigating this time of fractured trust yeah. when you your company, more than most, yeah. really depends on trust? There's no more trust than <laughs> leaving a child with someone else. You're absolutely right, Laurel. And, and one of the things that we learned when we were in a we were in a financial distress situation prior to 2012 and and as I mentioned Tom came in our CEO and said we need cultural transformation uh, I'll give you a simple example of just listening and building confidence uh, one of the first decisions we made in a company that was losing or declining 14 quarters consecutively is we changed the dress code of our teachers now if you think about that you scratch your head and say that sounds very very strange but when I traveled the country and, and sat with uh, teachers and said, what can we do for you? They said, all we want to do is, can, can we wear jeans to work? <laughs> and when you really came back to the office and talked about why can't teachers wear jeans, the conversation was all around professionalism and, and policies and this and that. Well, that's clearly a divide around the reality of a situation with a teacher on the floor all day long with children and being comfortable in that place and a company feeling like they're projecting professionalism to customers. We immediately made a change. Five years later, I was just talking to a, a teacher celebrating her 30 year anniversary and I said, how do you feel about where the company is today? And she said, Whaley, thank you for fighting for us. And she recounted that experience of us changing our practice to allow them to wear jeans. That's such a little piece, but think about the magnification. And it all came down to listening and building credibility. Something simple that made a big just difference. So we'll talk more about how we can rebuild trust and who should lead the way when we come back. We're back in two minutes.